Today, I am going to be demonstrating how to assemble and master EPs in the audio montage and um, some best practices for that. I know I've covered some of this before, but I'm going to really focus in on the audio montage itself and why it's so great for mastering EPs and albums. Because, you know, aside from the sonic processing of mastering, which is probably the more fun and exciting part. We do need to be aware of, you know, properly assembling CDs and albums, EPs. Um, I shouldn't have said CDs because they're not so popular, but assembling an album so that it flows correctly from song to song, um, especially when you have an EP or an album where two songs overlap, which I know is not a big deal to do in your DAW, but it's a little tricky to export uh, master files that don't have a glitch or a hiccup when... Uh, when you play them back to back, um, you know, to check them and of course upload them for streaming. So I'm going to, in the album I work on today, I'm going to do a couple song crossfades so we can talk about, you know, some things to look for if you are mastering an EP or an album or songs crossfade, um, you know, and we're going to talk about rendering various master formats, um, you know, anything from your 24 bit high sample rate waves, 16-bit uh, 44-1 waves, some distributors still require that, uh, DDP file, uh, reference MP3 files, which a lot, I find that a lot of my independent clients really like having MP3 versions of their album to share with friends and family, with artwork and metadata, and they're also useful for download codes. If you are releasing your album on vinyl and you want to provide a download card for the album, the, those download services typically just host the files you provide. So if you want to provide MP3s with all the metadata, WaveLab is makes it very easy to do that. So um, I'm going to talk about all that stuff: assembling um, a montage, you know, doing all the track markers, metadata, rendering, all that good stuff. Not really going to focus on the audio processing because that's really something that's a whole different deal. That's a, that's a, that's that's hard to teach. I mean, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll do some pointers, but this is not really going to be how to do mastering. It's more about how to use WaveLab to do your mastering and, and your workflow, getting songs in and out of WaveLab correctly. Um, a couple of things I wanted to mention would be um, this website I have called wavelabhelp.com. And you can go on there and download a bunch of presets and files that I've created. Um, the first um, download is my entire preferences folder. Um, and there's a video on the videos page about how to load that in. I also have just the render presets. If you just want to grab those, we're going to talk about render presets a lot today. So you could just grab those and load those into your um, preferences folder as well as the metadata preset. Um, if you go to the videos page, the very last video on the bottom talks about your preferences folder and how to manage that. Um, there's a downloads page. If you haven't downloaded 10.0.70, um, that's been released for a few weeks. You can get to it from this page. Um, you can also download a PDF of my shortcuts, um, the default Mac shortcuts, the default Windows shortcuts, st my Stream Deck profile, all the good stuff. Um, there's a place to book one-on-one -on -one Wave Lab sessions. I've been doing a few more of those lately. So you can click on this page and go to a calendar and set up a time. Um, and then the very last thing I want to talk about real quick before I get into it, because it's going to relate to what we're doing today, is a website called Sampley. And I've been using this to send out my mastering projects lately because there's plenty of services that do this, but Sampley is designed for mastering. It's just Sampley, um, Sampley Audio um, is, the, is the URL. I believe it's sampleyaudio.com. Maybe it's sampleaudio.app. But if you just search for Sampley Audio, um, you can load in your um, master versions to send to your clients. And the cool thing is, is the player looks a bit like this and will look exactly like this. And as you can see, it displays the metadata that's in the file. It doesn't just show you the file names, which can be a little bit ugly. File names can't always support um, special characters like metadata can. And the really cool thing is that it plays this Gaplessly, so any songs that overlap, there's going to be no hiccups. Um, it's going to go right from once. It's like a DDP player, but on the web. A uh, really great tool for um, sharing your masters with clients, so they can listen to it on any device without any hassle. Because a lot of the file sharing services, 
the big ones, they have bad audio quality and a lot of things can go wrong. So check out Samply if you're looking for a, a great way to share your um, mastered files with your clients so they can listen without any issues. So let's get into it. If anyone has any questions along the way, I'm checking the chat and um, I'll try to answer any questions as they come up, but then there'll be a little Q&A at the very end if anyone has um, specific questions. So um, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about are related to my specific WaveLab setting. So if you don't have my preferences, you may want to download and install those. But um, we're going to master an EP. Uh, it's a short album, a long EP, however you want to look at it today. And I just have a dummy folder called the WaveLabs. That's my band name, my client name that I'm working on. This is the album name. So I like to make a folder structure that is like this because it comes in handy within WaveLab, and you'll see why later. So I have the band name, the album name, the original files. Um, the original files are 96K, so I'm going to work at 96K. I also have a folder of the reference versions. That These are versions that are pretty common. The mix engineer put a limiter on there to get it loud and approved and get a feel for what it sounds like. Um, when it gets pushed loud, and one great thing with WaveLab 10 is the reference tracks in WaveLab 10. So at some point, I'm going to load in these um, reference versions and be able to compare what I'm doing with, with, with what they did and make sure that it's at least as good and hopefully maybe better. But it's a great way to just A-B stuff. And, and the cool thing with reference tracks is they are not... They don't go through any of the processing that are, is inserted in your session. So you can insert plugins in a number of places in WaveLab. Reference tracks bypa bypass all that. And that way you're just hearing the actual audio on the reference track and not the reference track through all your processing. So I'm going to make a 96K audio montage. Um, I don't want to focus on this too much, but WaveLab has two main workspaces, an audio editor and an audio montage. If you go back to my website or just search on YouTube, I did a whole video on the difference between the montage and the audio editor. But today we're going to be working in the, in the audio montage because it's just a great place to do non-destructive EP and album mastering. So uh, one way to make an audio montage would be to press this button. And I have a default montage set so that it opened with a bunch of settings that I like. And then the shortcut to do this is control nine. If you're using my settings, you can assign pre, you can assign shortcuts to load certain montage templates. So it's very fast to get started. You know, I have one for 44, one K one for 48 K all the different sample rates, a few different needs, but the main takeaway is you can create a shortcut that opens your preferred montage layout and template. So um, as you can see, I don't have the master section visible at all. It's floating I, and I can toggle it with control M and that will let me see it or hide it. I really just have a metering plugin in the playback slot. I don't use the master section for any plugin processing because this master section is not saved with the montage automatically. And it just, it, for me, it's hard to work with. So I hide it if you're wondering where it is. So step number one would be to import or insert some files into the montage. Now, an important thing to know about WaveLab is it doesn't copy the files for you. So that's why I've already put the files I would need in a very specific place. You know, they're not in my downloads folder. They're not on my desktop. They're not in some random place. They are in the folder for this project and for a good reason. And it's original files. So I've already done that. And I mentioned this because some programs will copy the audio files for you when you load them into a project. Uh, WaveLab does not really do that. So you have to be really um, careful and sort of disciplined about where your files are. So I'm going to press Command I because I've customized that shortcut. You could use Shift Command I if you're using the default settings of WaveLab. But basically, we're going to insert the audio files into this um, montage that we need. So I'm just going to select all the files. I'm not going to select the reference tracks yet. So I've got them all selected. And before the files are inserted, a pop-up window appears because this lets you determine the song order of the um, album before you insert the files. And this is great. 
Usually I'd be looking at my email or project manager to get the song order, but since this is sort of not a real project for me, I need to just reference the reference files real quickly um, to get these songs in the correct order. All right, so now I've got the songs in the correct order in my list here. There's a few ways that we can insert them into the montage. And the first one is to line up all the clips or all the songs on one audio montage track. And that's not bad. Um, I don't want to do it because I don't want to redo my ordering. But that would put all the songs on one single montage track, which is not really a problem because WaveLab has clip effects where we can put plugins on each song directly. I really prefer to use the stagger option. That's going to alternate the files between two tracks. Um, and I just prefer this layout and look. It's a personal preference. You can overlap clips if you just use a single track, but I like to overlap clips You know, if we have two songs that crossfade. I like to use those uh, on two tracks because you just get a little more control over the fade out and the fade in, and you still get plenty of waveform visibility. So I'm going to choose stagger. The third option would be perhaps if you're mastering stems, this puts all the files on their own track starting at zero. Um, not really useful for mastering unless you're doing stems. So I'm choosing the second option. And as you can see, it, it laid out the songs in the order I told it to. Um, my particular settings of WaveLab tell it to add no extra time between the files because there are times when I don't want any time added. I, I like to set the song spacing manually by listening rather than just have it set to two seconds or something random. Um, so we'll get to that. The first thing I like to do though is save it. Command S. And this is part of why I have such a strict file management structure. I'm going to copy the band name, put it here, put a dash, copy the album title, put it there. And I have a little clipboard helper tool that pastes this text of 6496 digital master version one underscore. The 64 means that WaveLab is processing in 64 bit floating point precision. It's a 96K sample rate montage. It's the digital master, it's not the vinyl master or anything. It's version one, and the underscore just indicates that it's the master montage with all the plugins, which we'll get to later. And you'll notice that WaveLab. By default, it's going to choose to save the montage in the same folder where the files came from, which I find to be very um, helpful. That's usually what I want. Um, and so that's where I'm going to save the montage. You could save the montage somewhere else, but um, I don't see why you would. Typically, I want the montage to be right by the uh, files it came from. So I'm going to press save and lock that in. Now, the first thing I like to do is trim up and clean up the files. This is going to be more of like an in-the-box mastering session where there's no analog gear used. And if I were using analog gear, I would probably do that in another montage session because it can get a little messy and a lot of plugins. And my preferred method is to, you know, get the song sounding as good as possible through the analog chain, get them very close, get everything trimmed up, cleaned up, and then load them into a clean montage to kind of finalize, assemble and finalize, and some small tweaks, which you can still do. But we're going to approach this from an in-the-box session, but a lot of this would apply. Let's say you already have things really dialed in and you're just assembling the montage for, for final output. So we're going to trim these up. Um, my captures from analog, if I was doing an analog thing, would already be trimmed up, not only trimmed up, but they would have 200 milliseconds of digital silence which comes in handy when you're doing the track markers, but um, you can use shift in the scroll wheel to enlarge the waveform, which I find handy for this step. Um, I'm gonna kind of go quickly through this because it's not the most exciting part, but I'm gonna, you know, that that's we're gonna that's some noise, and this is where the actual um, song starts. And you can determine that by listening where the song starts. If there's rustling you want to get rid of, um, this is all usually it's kind of subjective. So and then I would hit play and listen to how that ends. And I typically want to do a fade out. There looks like a little click there that we could clean up. But 
I typically tend to fade out the ends of each clip um, so that any noise floor, you know, fades to zero between the songs. And there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's just what sounds good to you. And then the next song, um, there's a little bit of room tone and dead space. And then I would just listen and say, okay, that song is ending and that song is starting. So how does it sound? You know, does does it need more space? Does it need less space? That's really um, some clients leave it to your judgment to do. You know what you think is best, and you fine tune it. Some people give you a really. I have some clients that give me a continuous file of the entire album that's already sequenced how they want, and I put that on a reference track, which I'll show you in a little bit. And the cool thing with that is you can visually line up what they did and prefer to your files. And that is um, really handy. I'll show you reference tracks in a little bit. I'm just kind of doing this quickly and somewhat, you know, not extremely precise because I want to get onto the other stuff. But this is the stage where I'm just listening to how that song ends and then how does the next one come in. And it's important to do that for all the songs, of course. So I'm going to do this quickly. I'll do a, I'll do a song overlap because we're going to discuss song overlaps and why um, you got to watch for some certain things i'll do it on the uh, next one um, if you need to quickly move between the clips you can use command and page up and down as a quick way to get between the clips this looks like a good one to do a crossfade this song has a long drawn out ending and let's say we, we want the other song to kind of start as the other one's fading um, this is why doing it on two tracks is just really, um, really helpful to me because you get a really good visual of what's going on instead of trying to do it on one track. Now, I am in ripple mode, so when I edit something, everything after it follows along, which is nice. Um, I'll zoom out and show you that. So we'll say that that's how the client wanted it, a little crossfade between those songs. So right now I'm only caring about how does it sound. I'm not worrying about track markers. Um, obviously not worrying about how the ma mastering sounds. I'm just kind of getting the transitions dialed in and getting a feel for the material. Um, that's part of why I like to do it first. It's just kind of get this stuff out of the way. Get a feel for how things sound. Make sure there's no issues. And don't forget to do the end of the last song. Even though it doesn't go into another song, you want to make sure that there's not a bunch of dead space or a random sound and just do a nice clean fade out. I like the exponential fade. To me, this fade, you know, this is just fading out the last note um, tastefully. To me, this fade sounds a little abrupt at the very end. So I have a shortcut where I can select a clip, press the X key, and it will do an exponential fade. And all your fades are um, in the fade um, ribbon tab up here. Um, so now let's we let's say this album sounds great as far as the, you know, the song layout. Um, there's a number of you know you could go into the audio processing next, but while I'm in this mode, I'm going to go into um, the track markers and things like that. So. Um, Let's see here, track markers. Um, there's a thing called the CD Wizard. And the CD Wizard um, is a really useful tool for creating the initial track markers uh, in a really precise way. And the great thing about the CD Wizard is that um, it binds the markers to each clip. So when you move the clips around, the markers follow along. I've seen some people manually insert markers, which you can do in the Insert tab, but then you have to manually um, attach the markers to each clip. So the CD wizard is just a really great part of WaveLab. And it's in the CD tab. And it is, I use the shortcut so I lose track of it sometimes. It's this icon right here. And for me, it's just control C, the letter C um, brings up the CD wizard. And uh, one great thing about having my um, montage template is that this CD wizard setting is already selected. So because I've made a montage for my template, 
the CD Wizard is already set to JP Start, which is how I do um, montages for you know markers for every montage, whether it's an EP, album, or a single song, and um, that's how I do it. So this is going to um, create CD markers at all the clip boundaries. It's going to use splice markers. Sometimes I see people using start and end markers, and then there's space between the end marker and the next start marker. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's kind of an old way of working. It leaves room for error when you're exporting your um, songs as a tracks because sometimes it could um, omit the space between the two markers. So you, these days you kind of don't want to have any space between markers. Um, any ex, any periods of silence are usually part of the previous file, which I'll talk about in a little bit. It's going to quantize the CD markers to the nearest CD frame, which... Even if you're not making CDs, I like to do this because you never know if a client is going to make CDs at some point. I like all my EPs and albums to have quantized markers because um, then you're kind of um, future-proofed against um, if they decide to make CDs. And we're talking fractions of a second, but with some projects that can make me make a difference. And this way you're just kind of protected. Um, and also the way that I render, it's going to quantize markers anyways. So I like to be in control and make sure I know where the markers are. Um, if you had the ISRC codes, you could put the first code um, in this box and then it will increment the numbers up, you know, from there, which is what most albums are, but not always. I'm going to show you how to add them later, um, you know, because a lot of times the ISRC codes come in after the fact, but you could add it now. So let's go back to the CD wizard. I, I didn't apply it. So for me, this is a, like a split second move because I have a stream deck, but I just want to show you what I'm doing. And then I would press apply, but watch how quickly you can do it if you have a stream deck. Because um, what I did is I called up the CD wizard and then I applied it. And I knew that it was the correct setting because that's how I want it. Um, so you can, do, you can do all this stuff so fast. I'm just going slow because I'm explaining it, but that's boom, CD wizard. Now you have... Markers for each song, but watch, the markers move with the clips. So, you know, if you're going to do a, if the client would request more time or less time between songs, you don't have to worry about your markers not moving. Everything's locked. Uh, so a couple things to be aware of. Um, you know, the markers are created at the start of each clip as well as then quantized to the nearest CD frame. Um, this is part of why in my normal workflow, I have 200 milliseconds of silence digital silence baked into the files because then when it makes the marker at the start of each clip, the marker is not right on the downbeat because that's usually too abrupt. Um, as you can see, I purposely placed this clip at right about 200 milliseconds. This is a strange one because there's a little bit of rustling that they wanted, but if you had a song with a strong downbeat, 200 milliseconds is a great little buffer, but you'll notice that the marker is not at zero. So we got to fix that, but we also got to fix the rest of them because all the markers were pretty tight to the downbeat, which is not usually ideal, especially if you have all the space to work with because of the spacing between the songs. You, you want to offset the marker a little bit so that when you skip to that song, there's a little buffer. There's a quick way to do that. Um, you can go to functions, and there's, a, of course, a shortcut for this, but you can go to, sorry, go to the markers tab, functions, and um, move multiple markers. And I, again, have a preset here that's already loaded. It's going to move the start marker and the splice markers backwards by 200 milliseconds and quantize them again to the nearest CD frame. So watch what happens here. I press OK. This marker jumps backwards um, by 200 milliseconds. So, And they all do. So if I go to the um, first song, it's great because now my first marker is at exactly zero seconds. Um, one little thing to note, if, if your first clip is after 200 milliseconds, and the shortcut for this is tab and the letter M brings up this box. If your first clip is maybe at 300 milliseconds, you have to be careful because the other markers are going to be fine, but your first marker is still not at zero and you got to manually drag it over because I think it's great to have all the markers at zero. You can use shift and the... Um, right parentheses or the zero key to kind of quickly toggle between your CD markers and just double check things. So now I can see that they're all nicely offset from the first downbeat. 
Now we got to talk about this crossfade in a minute, but the rest of them are nicely offset. And one thing you have to be aware of to make a valid montage, the first marker needs to be a start marker, which looks like this. It's a, it's red. It's like a triangle pointing to the right. The rest of them are splice markers, which are, um, you know, two, two markers glued together basically. So these are all, that's why they're called splice markers. And then the very last marker needs to be an end marker. So if you're getting errors when you're rendering, when we get to that point, that is why, because to be a valid montage, it, it just has to start with a start marker. These can all be splice markers and this is an end marker. And the reason I use splice markers is because when I'm rendering the final masters, you know, we want all this dead space to be included in this file so that when you play the songs back to back, it has the right flow. If you used an end marker right here, and then there was space, and this was a start marker, um, there's a, ch you know, there's ways around it. There's settings for this, but it's also very easy to omit this space. And now suddenly the songs are too close together when you upload them to streaming. It would be fine on the DDP, but now your streaming master is different, and that's bad. So splice markers are the way to go in 2021. Let's talk about this crossfade. Wave Lab is not super... It can't really tell where you want this marker. It basically puts it in the middle of the overlap. Now, this is a, would be a bad place for this marker. So I basically manually put it where it needs to go. Um, so uh, this is kind of your discretion. Um, when you have songs that overlap, you're never going to get a perfectly clean way to, to separate them. You know, if you would listen to just this song on a playlist, it's going to have a, a sharp cutoff. If you skip right to this song on the album or if it's in a playlist, it could have remnants of the previous song. You know, unless you make a dedicated master for that song for single purpose use, an album context is always just going to be a little strange. You just have to pick the least awkward place to, um, put the marker now my other markers i talked about having 200 millisecond offset you know for down beats and first notes because like i said you have all this space to work with anyways why have such an abrupt start that it sounds too abrupt or even gets cut off in certain players when it comes to crossfades that doesn't really apply you know i wouldn't want to put it here i wouldn't want to offset it and the nice thing is you get a little um, indicator at the top how much you're offsetting it so i'm offsetting it 200 milliseconds right now i would think this is, i would call this bad because now when you press play you're going to have too much of the last song so when you got cross-faded songs you kind of have to put the marker close and you get what you get you know it's just it's, it's always going to be a little awkward so again shift in the parentheses let you very quickly just double check your marker placement um and now i want to talk about marker naming and i need to just take a super brief less All right, sorry about that timeout. I had to get something opened and I wasn't quite sure where it was. Normally I have a um, you know, project management app or email where all the titles are, but for the sake of this video, I just made a little note and it has all the details of the album. Because as you'll notice, the marker names are, um, the marker names are the song, are the original file names. And that's not really what you want because the way WaveLab works, if you get the marker names exactly what the song title should be, then um, everything else is easier down the line. Just trust me on that. Now, there's also the Clips tab. The Clips tab, I always keep the original names because you want to know if it's Mix 2, Mix 3, um, Vocal Up. You never want to change the Clips um, name because you, you really want to know what the original title was. So the markers tab is what I'm talking about here. We, we wanted to clean up these names because they're pretty bad. Um, but it's pretty common if you're getting outside masters to have files with this type of name. So I'm copying the true song titles that the client provided, pasting them in the markers tab. And it's very important that you copy only the title and there's no empty spaces after the name or before the name.
So it takes just a second to copy and paste these in. I'm a big fan of copy and paste because then if there's any errors, it's because they sent it to you wrong. Um, so now I've just cleaned up the marker names and we're going to get to some more fun audio stuff in a moment, but this is all part of mastering EPs and albums. So marker names are cleaned up, which is going to help us for CD text and metadata and file names and just in general. So that's important to do in my opinion. One little quirk with WaveLab I've noticed. I didn't know this till it came up, but there's different styles of apostrophes. So sometimes I'll paste a title that has an apostrophe and it seems fine until you go make a DDP or look at the CD text and the apostrophe has turned into a question mark. That's because the apostrophe style is strange. Don't ask me why. I'm not a computer wizard, but um, I have ways around this, but because how I'm working now, I just had to manually fix the apostrophes. You can kind of see the difference. That's like a little curly apostrophe. This is a straight one. Don't ask me why. It could just be a Mac thing, but I like to make sure my apostrophes are the correct format because it'll be a problem later. Um, now back to the ISRC codes. Um, sometimes you get the codes later or you forget that you have them when you start the montage, but by the time you finish, you realize that you have them. So I like to copy the first code in my clipboard and you can use command control C to get the CD wizard back. And, um, now we don't want to run the same one. We got to be very careful here because we don't want to make new markers again. We want to use my preset called ISRC only, or you could manually check, uncheck all the boxes. The goal is to get it. So ISRC codes is the only thing checked because that's, that's all we want to do at this point. We've done, we've already done the first step. You can paste in the first code, press apply. And if you go to the CD tab, you'll see that all the codes are incremented correctly, which is how a lot, but not all projects are. If this project had random ISRC codes, you just double click and you can manually enter as you want. But um, that's a little time saver. Um, so what else we got to do? Um, now, even if you're not making CDs, which a lot of people don't, WaveLab is kind of based around CD text as the way to manage all the correct titles and populate it to metadata. So just, if you're hearing me say CD text and you say, I don't make CD masters for anybody, just consider it a formality. It's just part of how WaveLab works and it's something you wanna pay attention to. So we wanna add the CD text because right now we've only updated the markers and we have added ISRC codes, but let's talk about CD text because it's, it's helpful down the line in a number of ways. Um, you would go to the CD tab and you would select this icon right here. Now I have a shortcut, which is shift in the letter T brings up the CD text editor. And as you can see, it's empty. So I use page up and page down to cycle between the pages. You can also use the scroll wheel for me, page up and down is cleaner. The very first page of the CD text editor is asking for the album info. So again, I would toggle to my project management tool or whatever, copy the album title, put it in there. Copy the artist name, band name, put it in the performer field. Um, so this is just for the album. Now we have to do it for each song, but we don't have to do it one at a time. There's a little time saver for that. If I press this button right here, it's going to copy this name to all the songs in one click. So now if I scroll through you can see that name is applied to every song very easily um, now we have to worry about the song titles because we've only done the album title um, and same deal um, if you press this button it will only do track one if you press this button over here it's going to copy the marker names to each song title now if you remember we we correctly named the markers just like the song titles are supposed to be so everything's accurate so in one press of a button all the song titles the correct song titles are pushed to the CD text name and you can double check it with page up and down. I like to put my cursor at the end of a title and then cycle through them. Cause now you can make sure there's no empty space after them or, you know, you don't want to have your cursor out here. That means there's dead space. Um, and you can make sure that none of the apostrophes turned into question marks and none of the accents or special characters, I have restrict to ASCII on, which is what CD text is. Um, sometimes 
titles need special characters, and that's something we manage later on in metadata. But for most titles, um, this works. So everything's clean and looks good. You can add songwriter, composer, arranger. I, I tend to not do that for most projects unless it's jazz or classical. Sometimes I'll add that. But this is what I do for 99% of projects. So everything's good to go, and I just press OK. Now you'll see in the CD text field, in the CD tab of the CD text, you'll see everything is entered um, correctly. So now we're getting into some more fun stuff, I believe, because if, you, if we double check, our markers look good. The titles are good. Now we can kind of dig into the sound. And for those that are new to WaveLab, um, WaveLab has, with the montage, technically four places to insert plugins. But again, I don't use the master section at all because it's global for, not only is it global for this montage, but if I open another file, um, if I open up another file, it would also be applied to this file which is bad. So the, for me, the master section is only useful for metering plugins and the playback processing slot. I'd never use it for the actual pl plugin processing per song or anything like that because it's just, it's a can of worms because you have to save and load it manually. It doesn't save with the project. So just kind of forget it's there in my opinion. But that's the fourth place, which I mentioned, but there's three places within the montage to insert plugins now your inspector depending on your layout could be over here on the right i have a custom layout which is workspace layout jp start i like the inspector up here because that's where it was before wave lab 10 when it was called um, i forget what it was actually called but it used to be up here and i just like it there but now it's called the inspector and there's three places for effects there's clip effects which is the green track effects which is the yellowish orange and just to be clear track effects are not for cd tracks album tracks ep tracks track effects are related to the montage tracks so any effects that were listed in here would apply to any songs or clips on this track so I, for that reason i really don't use track effects too often typically i'm using clip effects for uh, my per song settings and the montage output effects for anything global because that comes last within the montage. Now, again, that master section is after that even, and so just don't use it. Don't worry about it. Um, I will say that if you are, for some reason, working in the audio editor, that really is your only place to insert effects, and that's where you got to do it. But even if I'm doing a single song, it's in the montage for all the reasons we're talking about and we'll talk about. So those are the three places, clip effects, track effects, montage output effects. Now for me, for a lot of projects, I get the songs so dialed in that I can often use the same limiter, the final limiter for all the songs. And then of course, when we do dithering, that's where we put, it's a great place for a dither plugin because it's after all the processing and it's gonna affect all the songs equally. So just be aware that the output section is kind of like your master fader of the montage, it, it's where everything travels through it at some point at the very end. And clip effects are for per song. Now I have some shortcuts. Um, the letter C will toggle to the clip effects. The letter um, E will toggle to the montage output effects. And there is a shortcut for track effects, but I use it so frequently I don't know it's infrequently. It's Control T. Um, so these are all the places we're going to insert our effects. But before we do that, WaveLab has a great tool called the Meta Normalizer. And a lot of people are probably used to normalization when we talk about streaming services or after mastering. But in my opinion, normalization is perfect for before you even really start mastering. Because what this is going to do is get all the songs to roughly the same loudness. Now you still have to listen and fine tune by ear. And as you change the frequency uh, balance of a song, you know, you may feel differently about the level, but it's a really good starting point to get you 90% there because as you can see, these mixes are all different level and that's totally fine and normal. You know, I've had some clients stress out about their mixes are different levels and that's, you know, that's part of what mastering is. So, so don't worry about it. It's totally normal for songs to be of different levels. Um, 
And some songs are meant to be quiet. This could be an interlude. It's not. But if it were an interlude, then maybe you want it quieter. Point being, I'm going to use the meta normalizer in WaveLab to get all the songs to roughly the same loudness. And it's in the process tab. And it's right here, meta normalizer. I, of course, have a shortcut, which is shift in the letter M for meta normalizer. And it's important. I want to talk about something really important here. I'm not normalizing these songs to the same integrated loudness. That's what streaming services do. They, they analyze the entire song and then normalize it to a certain level. That's fine for the consumer, I suppose. But you don't really want to do that for mastering because if you have songs that have a slow build and you normalize them to the same integrated loudness, it's probably going to feel unnatural. Um, what I want to do is normalize the loudest parts of each song to the same loudness so that the choruses, the third chorus, or whatever the loudest part of each song is, I want those to be hitting the same level. Again, to start with, I'm, I'm not normalizing it to anything super loud here. It's just a starting point. Um, so that's why WaveLab has... I have a preset here for in-the-box mastering. And I like to use minus 16 LUFS as the target. Some people might use minus 18. Kind of depends on your preference. There are plugins that model analog gear that don't like levels to be too hot, and things like that. For me, minus 16 works. Um, but you, you can choose whatever you want. But the important thing is that we're going to normalize all the clips. WaveLab calls these clips. Each song is a clip. There's three options in here. Um, we don't want to use, or I don't want to use loudness of entire clip for the reasons I just talked about. Um, if, if a song has a slow build, it's not going to sound right compared to a song that's real steady because uh, it's analyzing the entire file. These, are, these two options are somewhat similar. Um, the bottom one is easier to explain. You know, the maximum short-term LUFS, which is, I believe, a three-second window. Um, I'm, I'm getting caught off guard here, but um, that's a factual thing that we can uh, discuss. And the maximum, that would normalize each song to have the same loudness, same short-term LUFS. But WaveLab has something a little unique to WaveLab called top of loudness range, which I think is essentially the same thing, but there are some special parameters that I'm not totally familiar with that make it, to me, it's even more musical and more natural than short-term short -term LUFS. Um, if I didn't have the loudness range option, I would use short-term loudness and be fine with it. But to me, this is even a little bit more natural to the ear for music and it's a little more musical. So I, my preset is set to this. So I'll start over. I'm going to normalize each clip to minus 16 LUFS using the top of loudness range of that clip. So the loudest part of each clip is going to be set to the same level. I'm going to ignore peaks because I'm going to be, you know, we're not even close to zero here. I'm going to be managing the peaks myself with a limiter. Um, so I don't care about that. I'm going to exclude audio montage effects, even though there aren't any. Um, I'm still going to, I, I, it's just chosen for good measure or for if you do it later. Because what I want to do here is adjust the clip level of each song um, before I get started. Um, the rest of the stuff is turned off. This is all we need. And we just press apply and watch how quickly it does that. And I'll, I'll do it again so you can see it again. But you're going to see the levels, the waveforms are going to change level and size. And it does it very quickly. And the cool thing about this is that it is non-destructive. And it does it before any clip effects. And you can also change the gain after your clip effects, but I rarely do that. But um, So this just adjusted all the songs quite a bit. You know, one of the songs got turned up eight and a half decibels. And if I were to play this and skip around to the loudest parts, assuming all the songs are of a similar style and instrumentation, this is really, really close to all the songs. Now it's not mastered. It's, it's not really that loud, but it's a great starting point. Um, so, you know, all the biggest parts of each song have the same loudness and I would listen through it and decide if my ear agrees with that. If my ear doesn't agree um, we can adjust the level right here on the clip itself. This is a volume envelope. But I like to reserve this for detailed automation. So if I felt that maybe, you know, it turned this song up eight, 
eight and a half decibels. If I felt like maybe that was a little extreme, I could just click in here and say, how about let's go six decibels, six and a half. Does that sound right? And then I would listen to that and say, yeah, okay, that, that feels better when I'm skipping from song to song. Now they all feel like they're the same level and maybe even a better starting point. But the meta normalizer gets you so close uh, very quickly. Um, so now I would dive into the actual mastering itself. Um, a lot of times I don't start with the first song. Sometimes the first song is a intro or a little strange. I like to pick a combination of a few things. I like to pick one of the better mixes, better sounding mixes, one of the more normalish songs, and one of the louder, louder songs. You know, I don't like to start with a soft or medium song. So I like to find like, what's the best of those three things? What's, what's the biggest and loudest song? What's the best sounding mix? Um, and just pick a song to start with, basically. A good song that's going to make sense for you to start with. Because you can base the rest of the album around that and some of your processing decisions. So let's just say, for whatever reason, song four sounds the best to me. Um, so I'll start with that one. And there's no right way to do this. Some people might prefer to insert a limiter right away, um, just as a safety precaution, and you can turn it up more later. So if I wanted to choose a limiter, you know, Steinberg has Master Rig with a whole bunch of plugins um, within it. And you could open up a limiter um, right here. I could shut off the equalizer. You could determine your ceiling. Minus three is probably a little low, but maybe minus 0 0.5 is a good ceiling for you. Um, whatever you want it to be. Um, I have a couple presets. Um, so aside from loading plugins in here, you can load plugin chains. So if you have a certain plugin or a series of plugins that works for you, um, you can load those in. So I'm going to load in... Um, kind of a just really basic um, limiter chain that I'm going to fine tune later, but it's just going to, just going to be there. And, and I use the shortcut E to focus the montage output. F brings up my presets that I've saved, but if you don't have any, or if you don't have that shortcut, you would just manage it here. You go load plugin chain, and then it brings up all the options that you have. I'm going to bring up this one. And I'm actually going to turn off the inflator because I don't want that on this particular project. But let's, that's, and this is only doing one, um, it's only pushing into the limiter by like one decibel. So it's essentially doing nothing. Um, I'll talk more about those settings later. But um, now we go to the clip effects and we decide what, what do we need to make this song sound good? You know, do we need an EQ? Again, uh, Wave Lab comes with Master Rig has a great EQ, um, it has a dynamic EQ, it has all the stuff that you can use, or obviously you can use third-party plugins too, um, whatever you'd like. So this is where you load in your plugins, and I'm doing it the slow way, but I could pick, for instance, FabFilter Pro Q. If I want to do some compression, I could choose, really a big fan of this plugin. If I wanted to use some saturation, um, Vertigo just came out with the VSM4, which is pretty awesome. But there's always the classic VSM3. Um, so that's, you know, that you can insert whatever plugins you want, and then you can rearrange the order, of course. If, if you need to change the order. Um, but what I like to do, I have some presets that work for me. Now, I, uh, um, I'm not saying they'll work for you, but... The way that I work here, you know, I've normalized the songs to a certain level to start with, always. And again, that's non-destructive, so it's not making new files. If you go back to our folder, you'll see that the only file that's been created is the montage, which is very small, 31 kilobytes, and a backups folder with a bunch of backups, but you get the idea. It's only referencing the um, files that I loaded in. So... Um, and I should talk about reference tracks very soon. But let's go back to clip effects. I have a plugin chain that is a great starting point. Um, it loads in a bunch of plugins that I like. I don't use them all. I eliminate some. But, and as you can see, it loads an EQ, but it's not doing anything. I don't believe in presets for like certain genres. It's just flat. But it's at some common frequency points that I like. Um, same with this one. 
Um, so this kind of gets me very close. I mean, when I press play, you can see that this song is minus 10 and a half LUFS, which is not the final level it's going to be, but it's really in the ballpark already. And I can decide if it's good there. If I want to go louder, I could um, add more output gain of this compressor. It's already adding 6 dB of output gain. It's last in the chain, um, but it's blended, so it's not quite that closer to three decibels but you know if i wanted to go a little louder i would just turn it up um, and again these are just clip effects so it's only affecting this song it's not affecting any of the other songs and if i decided i wanted to make it even a little louder which i usually do then i could figure out what's a good limiter setting you know is it am i adding 2 db of gain 3 db of gain um Whatever sounds good. I'm not really good here to teach you how to do mastering because it's so personal and it takes a long time to learn and develop your ears, all that stuff. So, But now that you can see, now that I've added some additional limiting, it's in the minus nine range and maybe that's what sounds good for this project. Who knows? There's no right number. I don't believe in mastering to numbers for streaming or CD. You just make one master for digital. That sounds great. And um, hopefully your client loves it too. So... Um, let's say that I've done all the work that I need to to this song. You know, I've done maybe just because it's a multi-band compressor doesn't mean you have to use all the bands. Maybe it just needs a little low end uh, tightening up here. Anyways, let's say I love how this sounds. And let's say all the songs have a similar arrangement. You know, it's a, it's a band situation and they're all it's recorded on the same weekend and it's very similar. Um, of course, you have to adjust from song to song, but let's say this is a great starting point for the rest of the songs. There's a shortcut to do this, but you can copy all the clip effects for this song. I just copied in my clipboard, and then you can... There's also a shortcut for this, so I'm going to be a little slow. But you can invert the selection. Now all the other songs are selected. And then you can go back to the inspector... And you can paste the plugin chain to all the selected clips. Takes a maybe I didn't press it. Takes a second because it's pasting a bunch of plugins to a bunch of clips. So now what we have is every song has that same plugin chain. And of course, that's not a great idea, but it's a, it could be a good starting point. And now you listen to this song and say, how does this one sound? You know, does it need a little less low end? Does it need a little more high end? And then you're jumping around and comparing it to this song. Because again, clip effects are specific to each song. So you can go from song to song and just play with the plug-in chain. Maybe this one doesn't need saturation or soothe, so you get rid of it. Um, maybe this one, you know, feels a little soft yet, but you like the gain reduction that's happening, so you add some output gain. Um, Maybe the start of it feels a little soft, so you do some level automation. Um, so you double click on the volume line, you can turn stuff up. Or something I do a lot, songs that start with drum fills, which I don't know if we have. Let's say this is a drum intro, I have no idea what it is. Um, if it felt a little weak, you know, you can highlight it and you can just bump it up. And by default, this automation is pre-clip effects. So I'm essentially driving more signal into my clip effects chain. Um, if you wanted it to be afterwards, you would go to envelope and you would select envelope after effects. And now it's after all your clip effects, but before the limiting, of course. I rarely do that. I usually keep it like this. Um, I've had cases where songs are too dynamic um, and you need to turn it up. Let's say that we love how loud it is at the third chorus. But maybe, you know, the front half, and I'm, I'm doing this very gen general here to be fast. I, I would obviously do it in more detail, but let's say the beginning feels a little soft. You know, you could raise up the level. I do actually quite a lot of volume automation and mastering, more than I see people talking about uh, online. I think it's really effective because rather than slam it harder with a limiter and compression, why not just automate up the quieter parts if it's too dynamic? It happens. Um, I've also had, um, let's see if there's a good case. Um, if for some reason the last chorus gets too loud, you can even 
I'm not saying it does, but if if we felt like this part was hitting the limiter too much, but we like the rest of the song, we can even back it down. So um, the envelope automation is really useful in WaveLab. Again, it's per clip. It's before the clip effects. Um, but also, if you decided that you love this processing and you want it louder, you could go to clip tab and you could turn up the post gain level. And this is going to be after the um, plug-in chain for that clip. Don't do that too often, but it is there. Um, let's talk about reference tracks. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. I've got my eye on it. But let's talk about reference tracks, because now let's say I, I feel pretty good about my mastering work. Um, I like how it sounds. Now it's time to see what are their reference versions sound like. You know, reference versions can be loud and limited versions from the mix engineer. References could be, you know, other songs. Um, you know, maybe you have a, a song that you mastered that you like and you can load in that WAV file. Um, WaveLab 10 has a new thing called reference tracks. And you can, of course, press the plus button and add a reference track. My custom shortcut is Control Option Command R. And that adds a new track, and you'll see it has an R right on the track. Um, I like to put it on the bottom, so I use shift and the down arrow, up and down arrow to move it around. Now, reference tracks are cool because when I put audio on this track, it's not going to play at the same time as this audio. I'm not going to hear both. I'm not going to hear both things at the same time, um, which you would in most pieces of software. So I'm going to grab all the reference versions and load those in. Now, these are 48K, and this is a 96K montage. And I guess I should have pointed out that WaveLab doesn't resample on the fly. So if you, if you try to load in a different sample rate file, it's going to have to convert it. And if I was mastering these files, I would make sure I was using a high quality setting. Um, but since this is just for reference and we're trying to do a video here, I'm just going to press OK. It's going to quickly um, resample those files to 96 so we can get them in this montage. And for this case, I do want to line them up on the current track. And this is where I might eyeball them. Um, or on the other hand, if, if the client would have sent me a single file to album to match their spacing, you know, you can, you can load it in and move your actual clips around to match theirs. This is not one of those cases. I'm just moving them around so that when I toggle between them, they're kind of in sync. You know, it doesn't need to be sample accurate as long as it's pretty close to so that when you toggle you're hearing the same part of the song um, I'm not going to do them all in the interest of time I do see a question over there um, let's do the first four but you get the idea you want to resync them um, and the other thing too if you don't get reference versions before you start doing it once you lay out the album and before you start doing any work you could also do this trick you could make a reference track and you can use copy clips to um, reference track. And that's going to drop them down. It's being a little slow because I have plugins. So that's why you would probably want to do it. There's a few reasons you want to do it first because you don't want to hear your plugins again. That'd be pointless. But my point is you can copy clips to a reference track and you probably want to do that first so that you have clean untouched versions of the, you know, mixes so you can toggle between what they sounded like and what you're doing and make sure it's better. So there's a few ways to use reference tracks. Um, the metal normalizer is showing DB and not LUFS. It probably is because you're on elements, you know, WaveLab elements has some limitations that I'm not fully aware of because I, I don't use it myself, but um, WaveLab pro, you know, you can normalize to LUFS and more specifically top of loudness range or short term, which to me is more musical for, getting started and listening to be honest, but that's a different story. But my point is I don't suggest using the entire clip because that can get weird if, if it's very dynamic songs. So what I've done here is I've loaded, this, this is from the mix engineer. You know, he slammed them with a limiter for better or worse. And now we have to make sure that we're not worse than that. Cause that would be bad. Um, so my point is when I play this, I'm still hearing what I did. Um, the reference tracks are there. If I want to hear the reference limited version, 
I press this little ear icon, and as you can see, it mutes the other tracks and solos this one. And now I'm hearing, you know, what the mix engineer did with some limiting. And the other cool thing about this is um, there's two settings, but we are not um, influencing the meters. I haven't done it in a while, so I, I lose track of where the setting is, but get to that oh yeah it's in this little box um, you can send this to your playback processing if you want to see the loudness of this track you can choose this option but otherwise it's going to keep showing you the metering of your work and it's just giving you the audio you can also route this to another hardware output so what i do because i have a really nice monitor controller you know i listen to everything through outputs one and two but I have a large interface with a lot of digital outputs. So I could set up in my um, preferences here, raw. Now I'm using a different sound card. It's a long story. I usually use the RME. But if you have multiple outputs, you could assign, I'll just do it. You could press the plus sign. You can press reference. And you want to be a reference track and not a regular track. Then you could choose, if you had outputs three and four, you could select outputs three and four for left and right of the reference track. And then now you see you have, um, well, I cleared the name, but you could select this. Point being, you could send the reference track to a whole nother stereo output so that you don't even have to use the solo button. You could be playing what you're working on, and then you could toggle on your monitor controller with the hardware to be... Um, this reference track instead. So instead of toggling in the software, if you have a, a nicer setup, you could toggle between what you're doing and the reference track on your monitor controller itself, which I, is how I do it. Um, but this is a quick way if you have a smaller interface with just two outputs. And again, the cool thing about this is even though I have a limiter on the output section, it's not going through this limiter. I'm hearing just this file and how loud it is. So I can compare my work to a reference. So reference tracks are great for that. Great for, again, referencing your masters up to a particular sequence, a whole number of things. You can even set, I've never done it, but you can set the reference track to be a live input. So you could have um, a streaming service such as Spotify or Tidal or Apple Music playing, and you could kind of pipe that into a reference track. So reference tracks can also be hardware inputs could be a CD player, could be a turntable for whatever reason, or it could be a digital loop of your streaming service. Um, and then you're um, comparing right in WaveLab, which is cool. So reference tracks, one of my favorite new things of WaveLab 10 when it came out. So, and the other cool thing is I tend to leave, if I do a reference track, I tend to leave it in the session because it's not doing any harm. There's no chance of it being rendered, unless maybe if you solo it when you render. But right now, when I'm just going back to work and dialing in how these sound, um, the reference track is, of course, not being heard, and there's no way, there's no chance of it being rendered as part of my audio. So it's good to keep in there, because you may have to go back to it. Um, so this is um, version one of the Digital Master. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to remove some plugins. Well, maybe not. I think I can find some things to talk about. Um, so let's say I love how this sounds. It's not a bad idea to double check your markers. Make sure everything's cool. Again, this one's really tight because it's a crossfade, as you remember. And I'm going to talk about that next. If I were to just render a wave of each track right now, 99% chance there's going to be a little glitch when we put these two files back together. Just because of how plugins and DAWs work, it's not a WaveLab problem. I know people that use other mastering DAWs, and they do a similar thing to me, which I'm about to show you. But again, I'm just double-checking my markers to make sure that none of them got screwed up in terms of placement. And you always want to check your last marker. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, these are all shifted because I moved them around. But it doesn't matter what's going on at the end of the reference track. It, it can be whatever it is. It's not to pay attention. But just for good measure, I'll do that. Um, so here's my album. It's not a bad idea to double check titles. 
I'm going to go over the rendering process as well as the re-rendering process if you have to update a file um, and just some best practices to be aware of. Because this is, I think, you know, people that do engineering, yeah, they can make things sound good. That's not anything new. But what I'm here to show you is how to get things in and out of WaveLab that not only sound good, but are correctly rendered, formatted, all the detailed stuff that is mastering that we that often gets overlooked or not talked about as much, but it is important that we, it's important that what we're seeing and hearing in the DAW gets rendered out and in the correct format and all these um, details. So I'm about to do some rendering now because this is where people get lost when they're new to WaveLab especially. Um, and again, that first marker is at zero. All the track markers look great. Um, ignore what you're seeing on the reference track. So one of the things I updated in my render presets the other day, and it's on the website now, is my initial render. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to render this montage as one long file first. And that might seem a little crazy because we don't want it to be one long file in the end. But what, what that does is it locks in all the processing accurately. Um, many years ago, I was working on a project that had overlapping songs. And the DDP was fine, but the waves that I was rendering had a little tick at the song transition. I could not get rid of it. You know, I could have probably spectrally edited it, but I'm like, you know, I want to find a way where that would never happen again. And I thought, well, how come the DDP is correct and the waves are not? Well, the, the reason is when you render a DDP, it's one long render. It doesn't go track by track. And I said, well, let's apply this to rendering waves. And it turns out a lot of people were doing this too. I just didn't know it because who wants it? It's not a very, you know, exciting topic. But the first thing we're going to do is render a wave or a full. We're going to render a continuous wave of each of the entire montage, actually. So a full. This montage is going to get rendered as one long file. And you may notice that I'm not dithering yet. Um, I haven't applied. There's no dithering in my limiter on purpose. And I, I haven't inserted a dithering plugin. So. One thing that people don't realize with digital audio is here's the original file. Uh, actually, it was a floating point file. Let me open up a 24-bit file. How do I want to do this? Well, let's just let me just tell you this. When you have a 24-bit file and you do any processing, it turns into floating points. So even though that's why when I started this montage, it only asked me about the sample rate. It didn't ask me about the bit depth because it doesn't matter. Um, all the processing happens at, I have mine set to 64-bit floating point. You could set yours to 32 if you prefer. But all the processing is happening at floating point. So the moment, whether it's a 16-bit file or 24-bit file, the moment you load it in and do any changes at all, digital, digital, um, well, let me just, I have an idea how to show you this. Let me take some files that I have rendered. Here's a 24-bit. This is a mastered song, but so when I play this, I'll have to bypass all this. When I play this file and check the bit depth meter that comes with WaveLab, which is a great tool in the tool, tool windows menu, it's 24-bit because that's what I rendered it as. This is a final file, or it could be an incoming mix that's 24-bit. But watch what happens. As soon as I do any gain change, I just change the gain by a four-tenths of a decibel. Now it's floating point. So no matter what your files come in at, as soon as you do any processing, it is... Um, it goes to floating point audio. So if I put this back to zero... You'll see it'll go back to, it should go back to 24-bit. Um, yep, 24-bit, because that's what the file is. Any processing, floating point. This is true for plugins as well. Once you start EQing, doing any plugin work. So my point is, the audio that I'm working with, no matter what it started out as, because I'm doing processing in the digital realm, it's, it's floating point. And I'm going to render a file that is floating point. I don't want to reduce to 24 or 16 yet. I don't want to commit to that. All I want to do is lock in and bake in the processing that I'm hearing. We'll do dithering later when we render the files, but for now I'm rendering a floating point file. So 
WaveLab has the render tab. And the cool thing with the render tab is that it has render presets. And as you can see, I have a bunch. And this is one thing I updated. I used to have two options here and they weren't really named very well for other, they were named well for me, but not other people. So I, the first one is zero, zero initial montage render. And the reason I named it zero, zero is so it's at the top and you'll notice there's a little underline under zero. So I can just open this menu and press zero and it selects that for me. But basically we want to choose this option and in initial montage render. And I do this if, even if it's a single song for reasons I'll explain to you, but of course for EPs and albums. And what that does, the presets um, change a bunch of these settings to certain things, which I'll run through real quick. We do want to render the whole montage. We don't want to do it by tracks yet. Um, we want it to be a 64-bit flo floating point wave. Um, we want the name to be unchanged. And then there's two things we have to manually set. We have to set the, the location where it renders, and we have to give it a name. But the render presets get a lot of stuff started for you um, so now we the, what I do next is determine a location and I press the folder select destination folder and I'm going to navigate to this project the wave labs and I'm going to go into the album I'm not going to go into original files just the f album and I'm going to create a new folder and type in 96k renders I have shortcuts for all this because I do it all day every day and it creates a new folder called 96k renders. And that's all you have to worry about. The other thing we have to do is give it a name, this file a name. And I like to give it a useful name, something that re represents the artist name and the album title and the version number. So I would simply copy the artist name from this area, which is very handy that it's there. Maybe do an underscore to separate it, paste the album name, underscore version one. So I'm just calling this artist name, album name, version one. If it's a long name, sometimes I'll abbreviate it because this is just for internal purposes. So we're gonna render a full wave to this um, 96K renders folder and just, you can press start or you can press command and return. And let's see how long this takes because I have a few other things I wanna talk about while it's rendering. That is going to take too long. So I'm going to just remove some plugins just so it renders faster. So don't pay attention to what I'm doing. The only bummer is the waveforms aren't going to look huge and fat, but you'll get the idea. I was joking about the fat part. So let me just remove some plugins here so it renders faster. Of course, the render speed is going to depend on your computer and what plugins you're using, what sample rate. But I just cleared all my clip effects just for the demonstration purposes. Of course, you would not want to do that. But let's say we still love how this sounds. Now we got to render it. All the stuff I talked about. Render preset. Give it a location. Give it a name. Press go. Um, now my output limiter is still on there, although it's bypassed. See, I'm... I'm getting distracted by showing you stuff. Um, let me just take that off too. I'll use at least a limiter so something's happening. But so this is rendering the full montage. Now there's a few things I want to talk about while this is happening because it won't take too long now. Um, it's rendering a f one wave file of the whole montage, but some of the other things in the render preset that I didn't talk about are these options. And option number one is to bypass the master section. Because I don't have any processing in there anyways, I'd like to just bypass it just for good measure. Now I always have, I don't even have the faders showing, but they're always at zero and locked, um, as you can see here. Um, and in the inspector, there is a fader and a pan, but I always keep that at zero and lock too. I do all my level work with, you know, the clips tab, the plugins. I don't ever want to change. I want all this to be at zero and centered. I don't really want to ever change these things, but 
if for some reason you did, you could unlock it and play with the panning or level of a clip, but I like to just keep it locked for safety. Um, but the other things, so it's gonna bypass the master section. Um, add reverb tail. Reverb is a generic term. What this does is any plugins that have high latency, it compensates for that. Um, I could probably turn that off too, just as well. It's gonna copy the markers, which is important because we've precisely placed the markers and we want those markers to uh, be in the file. It's gonna create a CD image and cue sheet. Even though you don't need a CD image and cue sheet, WaveLab does, because it's gonna recreate an audio, or it's gonna create an audio montage from the resulting file. So you don't need this cue sheet, WaveLab does. And, it's, and it just did that, but it's gonna create an audio montage from the result. Um, yeah, so if I would have left my plugins on, which I took off for the interest of time, these of course would look mastered, whatever. But what this is, this is a new montage. Um, technically, this is one long file. If you go back to the finder, the folder I rendered, um, this is the file I, I just rendered. It's um, 29 minutes and nine seconds long. And there's that cue sheet, again, that you don't need, but WaveLab does. It does break it up into tracks again, but um, that's okay. Um, but technically this is one long file. If you go to the files tab, it's just showing that there's only one file in this montage. So um, next step would be to save this. I like to go back to the original montage, copy the name, then paste in the name, but change it. I'm gonna change this to 2496. And I'm gonna get rid of the underscore. Cause like I said, the underscore works for me to show that it's the master file. That way when I right click and look at my recent montages, I can see all the ones with the dash are um, the master and the rest are the derivatives. And the reason I put 24 in the name is because now I'm gonna add a 24 bit dithering plugin. Um, if you recall, I, I didn't dither on purpose. And if we play this audio, it's floating point. So we do need to dither before we render any 24 or 16 bit files. So the place to insert a dithering plugin clearly would be the montage output section. And WaveLab comes with Isotope M-bit dithering. And you can change the settings to how you prefer, um, save presets, the whole deal. I have a different dithering plugin that I like made by GoodHertz and a preset for it. So I'm gonna choose 24-bit dither. And one reason why I like this plugin is it has its own bit depth meter um, and good Hertz just makes really good plugins. So that's that. And again, you can insert that really quickly by having a plugin chain preset, even though it's not a chain, it's just one plugin, but it's set how I want it. And it's now it's dithering to 24 bit, as you can see, because it's running live. If I were to bypass this, we're back in floating point. Great. So from this point, I can render my 24 bit, um, 96k waves of this project now if we go to that song that crossfaded um, I don't have permission to play this audio for you but I can guarantee you that at this transition there is absolutely no tick pop hiccup sounds perfect and we're going to check it again when we render the actual files but we're already off to a great start because this sounds there's just no glitch I'm sure you've all tried to do gapless stuff in other programs and there's inevitably some kind of tick or pop. I could even open this in the audio editor. Yeah, it's great. It's smooth. Nothing to worry about. Now we're going to render track by track and the now all that the now that all the plugin processing load is off except, you know, dithering is basically nothing in terms of processing. Um, we don't have to worry about any glitches between songs. And as you can see too, all the dead space that we wanted, you know, we wanted a little breath between songs. It's all baked into the previous track. And then the next track has about 200 milliseconds of um, buffer before the next song starts. And that's typically what we want. Some genres more, some less, but 200 is a great starting point for most styles of music. Um, so now we need to render waves of each track of this. And the way I like to do it is Command F brings us to the files tab. I like to copy this name. That name that I came up with is kind of my naming theme or scheme for the entire project. So that's, it's important to put a second of thought into it. 
because it's going to just make everything look better um, down the line. For example, I just sent out a bunch of masters for this project. We'll use this one as an example. Now you can see that, you know, everything's nicely named. This is the 16-bit 44 waves. This is the 24-bit 44 waves. It just creates, it's easy to look at. So coming up with a good naming scheme is recommended because now everything is just really clear as to what it is. So it all goes back. There's a, there's a method to all this and why I do it this way. Anyways, you can copy this name, um, not paste it there. Um, you can copy this name and clear out the, you got to keep the backslash because we want it to go in that folder, but I'm going to paste that instead. Delete the dot wave, but add 2496 wave. Um, and then I'm going to go to the render presets and choose 24-bit wave tracks. And as you can see, when I selected that, it changed the render source. Now the render source is all regions. I'm going to render all the regions, and I'm telling it that a region is a CD track. It's not, you know, when you choose other um, options, you get other choices. I don't want to render the selected clips. Some people get confused about that, especially back in this section, because if you just rendered a selected, if you just rendered each clip, you're missing out on this audio and this audio, and now your songs are too close together and there's other problems. So unless you're doing maybe post-production work or something odd, or that isn't album or EP mastering, maybe there's a good reason to render clips. But if you're trying to render your CD tracks, don't render as clips because you're going to have a problem. So that's a long way of saying choose 24-bit wave tracks because this is going to render a 24-bit wave of each album track, each EP track, whatever you want to call it. And a couple little things that happened when I selected 24-bit wave tracks. I told you about the source. It selected this format for me. And if we dig into it, what it's doing is it's rendering, of course, a wave it's going to match the input stream of channels, because why would we want to change that? It's going to be stereo. It's going to match the sample rate, which is what we want. It's going to be 24-bit. Um, we'll talk about metadata later. Um, let's talk about it now, actually. Um, because of my montage template, when I created the new montage, like that, when we first got started, um, because it's a template, all this metadata stuff is loaded. It's preloaded. So when I'm doing albums, I never have to think about metadata. It's already ready to go. I only open these windows when I'm explaining how to do it, but I'll explain it. It's edit and ID3 is, is the main format of metadata, version two. And what this is doing is it's populating all the CD text info we entered correctly over to metadata. That's why it's important. Um, Cause basically you can enter this information once very quickly and then it just gets pushed everywhere without having to think about it. Um, again, I never open the metadata tab except for demonstration purposes. It does fill in some ID3 version 1 for older um, software. Some other things. The um, There's two ways to embed ISRC codes in files. There is, of course, the ID3 version 2 format has an ISRC, ISRC section. But there's also AXML. This is how the EBU, which I think is European Broadcasters Union, they came up with this. They're trying to make it a standard. It's debatable if it's a standard. But they suggest putting the information in the AXML chunk. And this looks like a lot of gibberish in code. But if you zoom in, all it's doing is it's putting, if an ISRC code exists, it's putting it in the AXML chunk, and you don't have to worry about it. So basically, you don't have to worry about it. When you load in, when you create a new montage for my template, the metadata stuff is already good to go. The only time you have to worry about this is to add the artwork, which we'll get to. But you don't do it in the first montage. You do it when you're ready to render the MP3s with artwork. So basically don't, the reason I didn't mention it before is because I didn't even have to worry about it. It's just there. It's good to go. Um, and so now I did all that. The last thing that this is doing is creating a naming scheme for the file. It's going to add a numeric prefix to the file. I have a lot of naming schemes, but this whole preset for 24-bit wave um, incorporates that. It's going to add a numeric prefix to the file name, which is important to keep the files in order, but what's great is then the 
the track number is not part of the file of the the metadata name. You don't see it anywhere really. It just keeps it clean. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So basically, that's a really long way of saying select this and then start rendering it. Again, you can press the start button. I'm in the habit of using command and return. And these render pretty fast. So that first render takes a while if you have plugins. This goes very quickly because the only thing rendering is the dither plugin, which is very light, light duty. So if I flip to my finder and go to the project again, we'll see this folder populating of wave files and they are nicely named, a numeric prefix that I didn't have to manually do. It just, it knows song one, song two and on. And then anything after the numeric prefix is the correct song title. So it looks good. Um, now if we hit the space bar, we can see that there's metadata in there too. Now I'm using Big Sur. Um, prior to Big Sur, um, Mac was not great at showing the metadata in WAV files specifically. It would show, I believe, one of these things, but not all of it. MP3s, it could show all of it more easily. But my point is, you can see that there's metadata in this WAV file, which is, I think, a good thing as long as it's correct. So now we have 24-bit 96K waves of each song, but that's not really useful in the real world yet for too many people. Um, and to be honest with you, I usually don't send the 24 or 96 waves until the project is approved. But let's work our way down to some more useful formats. Um, WaveLab has a batch processor. So what I'm going to do is downsample that floating point 96K version, not the, not the files I render. These are not going to be touched any further. I'm going to take this file, the whole album, and downsample it to floating point 44.1. Now, WaveLab has a batch processor for doing things like this. And to be honest, I'm not super familiar with the batch processor because before WaveLab 10, or actually it was WaveLab 9, WaveLab did not have the best sounding sample rate conversion. Now it has really good sample rate conversion. SOX is the algorithm. So I really should get in the habit of perhaps using that, but I want to demonstrate that you don't need to use WaveLab. You can use a third party. So I'm going to open up RX and add that floating point render. Again, the whole album has one file, and you can see it's 64-bit float, 96K. I'm going to downsample this to 44.1 floating point. Now I'm going to give it its own folder because it's going to be the same file name. And as you know, you can't have two files of the same name in the same folder, really. So I, I create a new folder called 44.1 renders and convert that down. And in the meantime, I can jump back over. And what we're going to do, we're going to use a feature called customized montage duplicate. The slow way of getting there is file, new, from current file. Um, customize duplicate, create, and then um, then you point to the file that way. That's the slow way. The fast way for me is I programmed a shortcut, which is command. And I can never remember if it's forward or backward slash, but it's the slash that's right above the return key and right below the delete key, not in the number pad. It's, it's right above the return key. So command and that slash will bring up this menu. And it's going to ask where is this file you want to use to create the new montage duplicate? And it's still processing, should be done soon. There it is. So th the key here is the file needs to be the same name, and it is. You can have it be a different name, but you have to tell it what's the difference. You can kind of, there's a little naming scheme, but uh, basically it, I just keep it so it's the same name, it's a lot easier. Point it to that folder, press OK, and now we have a new montage at 44.1. All the data is there. So it's an exact duplicate of my montage, but at a lower sample rate. Because in case it goes without saying, you, you want to lock in your processing at the highest sample rate available. Um, you know, you don't want to... I want to lock in all my processing at 96K, aside from the dithering. Now, if you have a stream deck, it's even faster because I've doubled up my shortcuts. I just press one button point it to the folder. All this stuff is done so fast when, when you get into flow and you're not trying to explain it. 
So the next thing we need to do is save this montage as something. I'm a big fan of going to the other montage. I can press Control and the letter N, copy the name of it, press Command S to save it as something. It's going to ask for the name. Now this one I'm going to call 2444 because it's going to have a 24-bit dither running live and it's going to be a 44.1 montage. And it's going to, of course, save it automatically in the um, same folder as the source file, which is helpful. Um, I had a thought. I wanted to say something. Lost it. Okay. Well, I'll, give, I'll come back to it if I think of it. But now we have a perfect recreation of the montage at 44.1. And with a 24-bit dither running live. I, I didn't even have to change it. It was there from the previous one. You know, this montage had it. Oops. This montage had it, so this one's going to have it too. So don't have to worry about it. Um, for If I need to, I can reselect this render preset, but it's probably still selected. The only thing I need to do here is I don't want to save it to that same folder. I want it to be to a new folder. And what I love about WaveLab is you don't have to um, you don't have to manually create the folder with a lot of clicks. You know, that's time consuming. All you have to do is go into this field, the location field, change the 96 to a 44, change nothing else, press command and return. And now I'm rendering. Here it is. Now I'm rendering 24 bit 441 K waves of the album. And the great thing here is all the formats are cohesive. You know, it's, I don't have to worry about the different formats having different spacing between the songs or different titles or metadata. It's all the same. So now that that's rendered, um, you know, some distributors, some distributors accept 24-bit files, but certain distributors, which I'm trying very hard to not name, are still only accepting 16-bit waves. So a lot of times I, I provide my clients with all the formats and explain what they're for. Um, so shift and the letter S would let me save as, and I'm going to change it from 2444 to 1644, which indicates that I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to load in a 16 bit dither plugin. Um, so, and, these montages are very small, so I'm not recreating all the files again. You know, the montage I just made is 24.9 kilobytes, so not a big deal. It's not duplicating the files. But I do like to work this way so that I can easily open the 24-bit version or the 16. And again, this is always indicating what... Montages are bit depth agnostic, but the 16 indicates that there's a 16-bit dither running live. You know, if I open this plugin, it's showing me 16-bit. If I open the WaveLab bit depth meter, 16-bit. So now I'm ready to render 16-bit waves. And there's a render preset for that, 16-bit wave tracks. You'll notice that the only thing that really changed is the format. And now I just manually change it from 24 to 16. And as you can probably guess, now I have a folder filling up of 16-bit waves. And again, all totally cohesive. Um, some people like to think about DDP as this whole extra step that takes time and is hard or annoying or charge extra. Now, you still have to check it, so there is extra time involved. But my, my whole philosophy here is assemble at once, and then you can render anything you want. You know, don't don't think so short-sighted that you have to keep recreating stuff because now you need this format and now you need that format. Assemble it once and then render away um, very easily. And you'll notice all these renders are going quickly because the processing is locked in at that high sample rate. So now let's say my client needs a DDP. Some of them still do. And I think DDP is a great approval tool, um, even if they're not making CDs because they can listen to it in a DDP player. Um, Steinberg offers a DDP player with WaveLab. That way they're hearing it without a media player adding more space between songs or screwing something up, which easily happens. So DDP is also a great mastering approval tool aside from being used for CD production. So DDP, let's talk about rendering a DDP. I don't have to do anything different. Um, it's already dialed in. 
All I have to do is render it. Now, DDP rendering is in a different location for some reason. Um, and I forget where it is because I use a shortcut, but it's not in the render tab, I can tell you that. Um, honestly, um, let's see. This shows you how much I use the, pre, uh, the shortcut. Well, I can tell you right now, my shortcut is shift, and then I press the letter D twice, and it brings up this. Let's see if I can find it quick. Right. Maybe I can get to it if I... Slightly embarrassing, but I just use the shortcut all the time. So shift and press the letter D twice. It brings up the right audio CD or DDP window. If I had a CD burner and I wanted to burn a CD... I don't have one connected right now, but it would be in this menu, but we want to write a DDP image. And a DDP image is technically, some people call it a DDP file, but it's technically a file set. It's a bunch of small files and, and one large file for the audio in a particular folder. And they all need to be there for it to be a valid DDP file set, or DDP image is a correct term, but a DDP file is a sort of incorrect um, way of saying it point is we need to make a folder for this um, DDP file set. And again, a great thing about WaveLab is you can select this folder over here. You can see some recent stuff you've, some paths you've used. And I'm just going to select this path. Now I'm not going to render it there. That would be bad. But again, the great thing with WaveLab is I can select this and just type in DDP instead. And now I'm rendering a DDP. Now, DDPs have to be 16-bit and 44.1K sample rate. So that's why I do it at this stage and not earlier and not later. But again, for me, it's not this big problem or thing to stress about. I've already done all the arranging, and it's, it's ready to go. So it's in a matter of less than 20 seconds, I have a folder. Now, this is my DDP file set. Now, if I was going to send this for CD production, I would zip it up and send out the zip file so everything stays intact because all these little files need to be there and the image.dat is the actual audio but if you're going to send it out for production they need all these files to be just like that so you zip it up and again Steinberg on the website has a DDP player where you can check the DDP it looks a little bit like a media player your client could check the DDP on their computer um, it's always a good idea to double check but that's how you render a DDP, and this zip file will be ready for CD production, assuming that there's no errors. Uh, there's one last format that I usually render, and that's MP3 files. Now, there's, there's some debate about whether MP3s can be rendered from floating point audio, 24-bit or 16-bit audio. There's a great video by Dan Worrell called WTF is Dither. It's a really great video that you should search for on YouTube. Um, watching that video, even though from a technical standpoint, I think we can make MP3s. We don't need to dither MP for making MP3s because there's enough noise in there. There's a good reason to make MP3s from 16-bit dithered audio because of the playback side, and he explains it in that video. I don't want to. He, he explains it much better. So ever since watching that video, I've been making my MP3s from a 16-bit source, which means I would make it from this montage. So. What I'm going to do is go to Render Presets, choose my preset of 320 MP3 tracks. And what that means is it's very similar to what I've been doing, but it creates a setting for 320 kilobyte per second MP3 files. And you can change it if you want and make your own preset. It's kind of a deep menu. You got to go way in here and way in here and choose something else. But that's why we have presets. So I have 320 MP3 tracks. Um, and then again, change the path to something else, MP3. Now, this is where I can add the artwork. You can put artwork in WAV files, but very few programs can display it, so I tend to not even bother. But MP3s can very much display artwork in WAV files. This is the only time I go into the metadata tab. Even though I'm, even though I'm adding metadata, it's, all, it's also preset. I never go into the metadata tab until it's time to add the artwork. So we go to ID3 um, picture, they call it. And now it's asking you for a piece of artwork. Let's see if I put one in here. Was I smart? Nope. I have a... Um, 
I have a piece of artwork somewhere. Maybe I'll have to steal it from another project. I know these guys just sent me some artwork. So I'm going to put this artwork in there. Isn't that great? Um, so whatever the artwork is for the album, you do need to make sure that it is um, a smaller file. That one's actually a little smaller, but um, sometimes people send me artwork that's like 20 megabytes or 30 megabytes. That's too big for what this purpose because um, that's going to make the MP3 really huge. For me, what works is something like 600 to 900 kilobytes. Definitely under a megabyte is plenty for this purpose. So that's the only time I'm going to the metadata folder. And now I can render MP3s with all the settings I talked about. Rendering the way. And now if I go to that folder, we'll see it's filling up with MP3s and the metadata and the artwork is there. So again, these aren't useful for digital distribution, but clients love to have these for download codes with their vinyl, um, to send directly to people for promotional use or friends and family. Um, just small email friendly files. So I think it's great to have MP3s on hand for un uh, you know casual listening purposes that look good. So if I loaded these into iTunes or um, there's a great, I like this meta app just for double checking things or editing really complex metadata like I talked about. Um, so that's how it would look in a media player. It looks great. It has all the information. Um, so that is basically rendering um, from start to finish, you know, assembling a montage, applying the processing, rendering a bunch of formats. I've already done a video on rendering vinyl and cassette masters a few months ago. I've done a video on single song mastering in the montage, which has a lot of the same principles, a couple different render presets. Um, but that's kind of it from start to finish. I'll take some questions in a moment, but... I wanted to show you um, revisions. Let's say the client, you know, I send this out and the client says, I love it, but there's two things. Um, thing number one is I have to send you a new mix for song number one because I forgot the backing vocals, something that's happened to me before. Um, and we want to add more space between songs two and three. So a couple changes. Those are pretty common. Or maybe it's, and, and can you just make it a little bit louder overall? So yeah, we can do all that. Um, so what I would do is reopen WaveLab, reopen my montage. And you have to be kind of disciplined about this, but I always save it as version two right away. So shift in the letter S, replace the one with the two. The reason for that is you always want to know what version one was, all the settings, because they might say, that sounds good, but can you split the difference? And now you don't really know what the difference was or is because you have you don't have access to version one or to, you know, you've lost that. Um, so I always save new versions. And again, the montage files are very small. Um, it doesn't take up any space to just save an, a version two. So let's, let's um, talk about replacing a file. Um, I didn't plan ahead for this, so what I'm going to do is what is the first song? Roll. I'm just going to make a duplicate of this file, and we'll pretend that it's mix two. Instead of copy, it'll be mix two. All right, so I've already saved the montage as version two, so we can always go back to version one. One really cool thing with WaveLab is you can replace clips, because this happens a lot. People always are sending new mix versions because they forgot this, forgot that, want to change this or that. And it's not really a big deal in WaveLab because all you got to do is highlight the clip. I press Command and R and it brings up this window, but the slow way would be um, so slow that I don't even know where it is. Edit. Um, I just used the shortcut so much that I... Okay, it's in the Insert ribbon tab. Replace audio file, and you can navigate to it that way as well. But again, I use Command-R to replace this clip, and then I just need to find it. Um, the Wave Labs, Original Files. Um, 
was It is in here right after refs, original files, up next to, why did it, oh, I think when I renamed it, I goofed it up here. We got to do dot wave. How did I do that? One more time here. Sorry about the delay. But the point here is we want to navigate to the new mix file and it just loaded it in for me. Now, it looks the same, so it's not going to be an exciting change, but you can see, you can verify on the clip name that it's now it's mix two. And now you have mix two in your montage. All your clip effects remain. Everything's the same. So if, if the change is super minor, like they just, you know, changed a lyric or um, if the change is minor, you don't need to do anything. You know, if, if, if they turn up the bass guitar, yeah, maybe you want to check out your EQ and readjust the clip effects. And that's why it's so important to have a version two of your montage or sorry, version one. And then you can work with version two and see what you do did in previous versions. Now they want to add more space between songs two and three. We can just slide that over. And because everything, um, the montage has ripple mode and I have it in global by default. So that means when I move, so when I add more space between songs two and three, everything moves with it. So the relationship between all these stay the same. The markers move with it. Of course, I wouldn't add that much space, but you get the idea. You can turn ripple mode off. There's been times where I wanted to do something like that for whatever reason. And you can turn it on on a track by track basis, which I rarely do. But typically for me, ripple mode is on. And that's that. So let's say we want to do that. And then they want to make it a little louder overall. So um, we crank it up more. Doesn't that sound amazing? Of course, I'm doing this quickly as a joke. But now we've made our changes. Um, because we changed the song spacing, the markers are no longer quantized. And the one thing with my long render that I do, it, um, because we're using, and this could change in a future version, but because we're using um, CD image and cue sheet to repopulate the data. It does shift the markers to the nearest CD frame. But again, I'm a, I'm a proponent of always having your markers quantized because you just never know. If the client decides to make CDs, then when you make a DDP, if the markers are not quantized, it's going to quantize them when it makes the DDP. And it, we're talking fractions of a second, but I think it's better for you to know where the markers are rather than having them get quantized because it could mean the difference of being here or here. It could mean the difference of catching the tail end of something or cropping off the tail end of something. My point is, now that we move the markers kind of freely without thinking about CD frames, I want to requantize the markers. So there's a setting for that in the CD wizard. Control C calls up the CD wizard. And I have a setting called quantize only. So that turns off everything you see except for quantize. So um, you, it's so small that you're not going to be able to see the marker move, but you'll notice a little red dot here. That means that it did something. It, it quantized the markers. And I, let me undo it. So we're talking a small amount. A lot of times it doesn't matter, but there are times where it does. So I'm just in the habit of always do it. Why not? It's going to quantize at some point anyway. You may as well be in control of it. So now we've made all the changes. We can render a new version. I, now I do a lot of the same steps. Initial montage render. Render it to the um, 96K renders folder. The cool thing is you can select this icon and it's going to show you the file that exists. Just delete the wave version 1 and change it to version 2. And now you're doing all the same steps again. Send it out. Um, you know, if you get to version 2, 3, you, you can start to delete some of these um, version one renders if you want to uh, clean up space because you won't need them. But that's how I handle revisions. It's also how I handle instrumentals. Let's say that this album gets approved, um, but they need the instrumental versions mastered. Then I would, and the album's done, I would revisit my original source montage, shift S, then maybe add instrumental to the name. 
then load in one by one the instrumental mixes on top, you know, in place of the main versions. Make sure the timing. That's the other thing too is sometimes new mixes come in with different timing because uh, they didn't balance it from the same start point. It's kind of frustrating, but sometimes you need to wiggle this around to get it back. Another good reason why you should always have your reference of version one. But if I'm doing instrumentals, I can load in the instrumental version to each clip. And the cool thing about that is that all the processing is the same for each song. I don't have to redo any of that. Um, you know, then I just, I usually add instrumental to the marker name really quickly. I would do it to all the songs, of course, but if you go back to here then, then you can put it to the CD text, which affects the metadata and the whole deal. So I only did half the songs, but you get the idea for instrumentals. It's kind of the same process. Um, and if you need 48K versions for a video or something, you know, you can also use the custom montage duplicate to get to 48K instead of 44.1. Um, it can go any direction, any sample rate. So that's basically EP and album mastering in a nutshell as far as that. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I know this went pretty long and I had another minor hiccup at the start where the mic was muted, but thanks for bearing with me here. I had a couple changes. Um, also using an SM7, so I don't know if it's better or worse, but um, it feels better. So anyways, if there's any questions, I'll answer them. Otherwise, head over to WaveLab Help, the website. A lot of resources on here. I always post the videos, so I'll post this one once I get off here. Uh, you can download presets. You can download... A list of the shortcuts there's a link to the facebook group uh, where i and a lot of others help people out with wave lab it's just wave lab wave lab users group on facebook um, there's the official wave lab forum where pg who invented and still develops wave lab is very active you can ask him feature requests questions he's more of a windows user i'm more of a mac user um, there's some other links and of course booking if you want to do a session so wave lab help there is one question here um, in the envelope tab, is it possible to have volume? And yeah, it's a great question. I only talked about volume automation, but if you go to the envelope tab, there's three, there's actually, I, I don't know how much I want to talk about it, but the, you can also automate effects on clips. Um, but let's talk about this question by default that shows you the volume and fades. So as you saw, I, I played with the heads and tails of each song. You can automate up or down certain parts like that or um, entire songs, um, a lot of cool stuff. But you can also automate the panning. So I've had to do this a few times. If um, for some reason you wanted to automate the panning, you can just flip envelope, flip it over to pan. And now let me, um, and what I like about WaveLab is it shows you what's actually happening visually. So you can see I'll try to do it on a bigger piece so you can really see it. But now you can see that all the energy is pan left, and now it's all pan to the right. Um, and something that something that I didn't know about for a long time, I discovered it more recently, so at the volume, because it's worded strangely. Hopefully that answers your question. And you can have these at the same time. It just it won't display them at the same time, but you can do them at the same time. So. Um, on this particular song too, there's my volume automation and there is my panning automation. You just can't, or you can hide it if you don't like how that looks, but you can do both. You just can't see both. Um, let's see here. It's only in the volume area and it's, it's worded so weirdly that I never clicked on it, but you can press convert, convert to stereo. Now, you can automate the left and right channels differently. So if, I don't know why I would do this, but if I wanted to turn up just the left channel in this little section here, I can do just that. And now it's only doing the left channel. So that's a little tip that um, I learned not so long ago for some reason. I think it's because it's called convert. Um, the last thing I'll talk about to see if there's any questions is you can automate clip effects but not in the way you may want to right now but there could be some 
improvements coming soon to Wave Lab. But let's say I have this um, EQ on the song. And I do it so infrequently that, um, forgive me if I'm being slow, um, channel processing, So if you ins insert an effect on a clip, and this is just for clip effects, you can press this arrow, and why can't I edit automation envelope? Now I can. So I'm telling it to do, instead of doing like a standard insert, I'm doing parallel processing, or you can do blend wet into dry, which is somewhat similar. And then you can edit the automation envelope. So now you get, um, a third choice. You get volume pan. Now you can blend this effect. Now it's not super useful for an EQ, but I just use that as an example. So now this envelope is actually how much of this EQ is being applied. I, I probably should have used the compressor. That might have been more or saturation, but you get the idea. Now I'm blending this effect level. So if if the first if I wanted to gradually, well, a good example would be like a telephone effect. If I wanted to have the intro of the song sound like a telephone. Could do something like this. I did it really sloppily, but this would be some kind of radio, lo-fi AM radio effect um, on the song. I could I could blend it from, you know, let me reset this. I can use the automation to kind of gradually blend it from that affected version to start the song to, you know, to nothing. So um, something like that. In theory, this would kind of start the song lo-fi, like the, this weird filter, and then it would gradually change back to full frequent, you know, for the full sound. So you can automate, you can use the envelope to automate the blend of effects, but not the parameters. So, well, I think that's all the questions we seem to have. Thanks for watching. Sorry about the technical difficulties last time and a little bit today. Uh, the next one will be um, at the end of June, actually. I'm going to take the end of May off. I'm going to do one in June. I'm going to start to bring back a few guests, a couple of Wave Lab users that you probably recognize their name, and do more of an interview style and have them share their screen and how they work in Wave Lab. But for now, that's all I have for this video. And again, thanks for watching it. And um, if you have any questions, any follow-up questions, just go to the Facebook group on WaveLab or the user forum on the Steinberg website and you'll get some more help. Thanks.